Ever feel like there's a little too much drama in your life? Well, if that's the case, then you probably have been caught in the drama triangle. If you've never heard of the drama triangle, then be prepared. You're going to start seeing it everywhere. Today, you'll learn how to spot the drama triangle, and even better, you'll learn how to escape it. One way to deal with the drama is to learn how to communicate better. If you haven't yet, take a moment to download my free guide to my top three relationship communication secrets. If you put these things into practice, they will help you stay connected no matter how challenging whatever it is that you're trying to communicate about. To download the guide, just visit neilsatin.com slash relate or text relate to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. Now I'd like to take just a quick moment to thank you for helping support Relationship Alive. Sylvia, Angie, Genevieve, Drew, Lydia, Anne, and Valerie, thank you all for your generous support. As a reminder, this show is my offering to you so that you can have the best relationships possible. If Relationship Alive is contributing to your life or the lives of people you love, please consider contributing to us. Every little bit counts. To choose something that feels right to you, just visit neilsatin.com slash support or text the word support to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And last but not least, if you're looking for a community of fellow listeners to get support for you in your relationship journey, come join the Relationship Alive community on Facebook, where we're creating a safe space to connect and converse. Okay, I think that's it. Let's get on with the show. Hello and welcome to another episode of Relationship Alive. This is your host, Neil Satin. Sometimes life can be really dramatic. There can be highs and lows. You can feel like you're the victim with people just out to get you. You can feel like you're doing your best to show up for the people in your life and they don't appreciate you. In fact, they see you as some kind of enemy. And in the end, all of this drama plays out in ways that keep us from being truly connected with the people around us. And these could just be our acquaintances or our colleagues and coworkers, or it could be, you know, the people in our lives with whom we're most deeply connected, our children, our partners, um, ourselves. So I was actually going through a situation about a year and a half ago and really struggling. And in reaching out to one of my friends about it, she said, you know, this sounds like a classic drama triangle. And I had never heard of a drama triangle before. So I was like, I'm going to have to check that out. I looked it up and there were lots and lots of references online describing what the drama triangle was. And sure enough, it felt like that was what was going on in my life. But it didn't necessarily help me figure out how to solve the drama triangle. And that's where today's uh, today's conversation comes in. We have with us an esteemed guest, Dr. Stephen Karpman, who is the person who created the drama triangle and whose work has evolved past the drama triangle in ways that help us see how to escape from these games that we play with each other in ways that actually build intimacy and closeness with the people in our lives. Or if we're not looking for intimacy, at least they keep us from being caught in a repetitive loop. So Dr. Cartman is the author of the recent book, A Game-Free Life, the definitive book on the drama triangle and compassion triangle. And uh, along with many, many other books and papers, um, and we will talk about that more over the course of today's conversation. If you are looking to download a transcript of today's show, you can visit neilsatin.com slash triangle, as in the drama triangle, or as always, you can text the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. 
So let's dive in today. Dr. Stephen Cartman, thank you so much for joining us here today on Relationship Alive. Thank you, Neil, for asking me, and I'll do what I can to help people with their lives. Great. That's the best we can hope for today. And uh, I just want to note that I'm I'm really excited to be talking to you. What people listening don't necessarily know is that you and I have actually been in dialogue for almost this whole past year and a half, maybe even more. Um, so it's exciting that we finally made it all work. You're very busy and presenting and getting your books together. And I'm glad that we're finally here today to talk. Okay. Let's just start. I mean, it's, it's probable that a lot of people listening do know what the drama triangle is, at least on some level. But for those who don't, or for those who haven't really thought about it for a while, let's talk about it and, and enumerate each of the roles in the drama triangle and then talk about what actually creates the drama. Um, so can we start there? Sure. The, the uh, drama triangle is something I created many years ago. Primarily, originally, I was working on uh, strategy in football and, and basketball, and I drew this uh, three-cornered triangle of different roles. And then it turned out to be applicable to, to theater, like there would be a villain and a, and a uh, hero and a victim. Uh, but eventually, the way I originally drew it is the way that uh, took off, which is, a triangle with the point down, which is the victim, in a one-down position, and the two people in the power position in the upper left corner had the persecutor role, which is the person that's always blaming, always putting the victim down. And in the other corner on the upper right is the rescuer position. That person is always helping and always trying to save and trying to fix the victim who somehow never seems to, to get fixed. And it's a very frustrating for the rescuer. So when you're in a challenging situation, at a minimum, it can help to step back and say, okay, which of these roles am I playing? And which role are is the other person or persons playing in this situation? Sure. Now, there's a difference between a, a game-playing role and real life. For instance, a persecutor might be an aggressor in real life and just being an aggressive person who might be critical at times, but it goes into the triangle when they have, they're linked in with someone in a non-ending game. So the persecutor is always blaming, always criticizing the victim. The victim can never do anything right, but the persecutor always has to be right because they don't want themselves to feel like a victim inside, so they always have to win. Now the rescuer has to come in and save the victim from the persecutor, but more than likely, the rescuer is a good-hearted person initially, and it's okay to be a rescuer in life, very good, actually, but it becomes a drama triangle when they're involved in an unending game with the victim who's always helpless, always wrong, never can do anything right, and they, they deplete themselves in their own, drain themselves in their own life, devoting their life to saving the victim, and meanwhile, neglecting their own life. And then the victim is a person who maybe from their past they see themselves as inadequate or insufficient and, and somehow get into the role of, of asking for help from people. But eventually, which is okay, but eventually if they get into a game, then they play the role of a victim. They're not actually the victim. They're playing the role of the victim, which is very manipulative and playing all sorts of games to keep the rescuer helping them and to keep the persecutor criti criticizing them. So then you have the drama triangle. That's the drama. When people get into dysfunctional roles and, and dysfunctional relationships, they get into the triangle. Sometimes they switch around different roles, like the rescuer might suddenly become the persecutor or the victim might get even with the rescuer by becoming persecutor. So then it gets complicated, and you get into a, a game that's people that can go on for years and people can't solve it or get out of it. So how do I know if I'm in a game or not? Well, it depends on the role, but primarily it's very frustrating. You're, you're involved with someone else. That's when you're in the triangle. And it's very frustrating because you, you feel drawn in, particularly the victim will draw a person in. It's like quicksand. You get drawn deeper and deeper and, 
and try harder and harder to to fix the person, to get him to think, to get him to realize things. The rescuer might say, I've got to get you to realize things. And the persecutor might say, you're dumb because you don't, don't understand anything. So it's when the relationship gets stressful or gets exasperating or gets a pleading of energy and, and uh, primarily nothing ever gets fixed. Nothing gets clear. Uh, nothing is understood. And it just seems to stay that way on and on. So if a situation isn't evolving and and it feels dysfunctional, then the odds are you're trapped in some sort of game. And you may not know that you're trapped. It just you, you keep wanting to try hard. It's one of the drivers. You try hard to, to fix things or to, to be perfect in your answers or be perfect in your feelings. So maybe the victim will change and the persecutor will make the criticism even stronger and stronger, thinking that will, will teach the victim a lesson. And, and by, with their strength, they will protect themselves from ever being criticized. So it's uh, primarily the, it's a relationship, and other people may notice it first, and you may not notice it yourself for months and years, and uh, you don't want to leave the other person, but you don't know how to uh, make the situation better or to get it livable. Yeah, and why do you think that it's not enough? Because this was my experience when this particular situation, and I can't get into the details just out of respect of other people's privacy, but... I saw it happening and I was like, oh, this is very clearly what is going on. And yet just recognizing that, you know, that I was playing a rescuer role, this other person was playing the persecutor role, and then um, someone else was playing the victim role. Um, just recognizing that wasn't enough to actually change the dynamic. And I'm wondering if you can give us a sense of why that might be so that it's not enough to just recognize that this is what's happening. Well, primarily most of the people that write about, about the triangle talk about uh, empowering. One needs to feel empowered that they are successful. And if they don't feel that they're successful, that nothing they're doing is working at that point, they may step back and say, well, perhaps I need to change something. And it starts by by knowing what the roles are in the drama triangle, that there's a persecutor, rescuer, and victim role, and people do get trapped in it and get frustrated. And once they know the roles, then they need to get in touch with their feelings and, and why they're in that role and what's their payoff. Like they're involved with people that they can't control. You can't control the, the persecutor or the rescuer or the victim. You can control yourself. So that at that point, you decide that you will control yourself and decide what to do about the game. Of course, you'll try to discuss it first, or you may get into counseling about it. Uh, but at some point, you, you, need, to, you need to decide that, that, uh, that the triangle isn't working for you and you move on if you, if you can't make it uh, work better for you or if you can't tolerate it. Yeah, and I think one thing that might be challenging is probably most people arrive at thinking about the drama triangle by feeling like they're a victim to someone who's persecuting them. And that would be my guess. Um, you know, cause that's the place where you feel like you're, you're being stuck in a situation of, uh, powerlessness. And, um, and so it seems like it might be challenging to, go to someone that you're perceiving as your persecutor and say, Hey, like, I think, you know, I was doing some reading online and I think that I, that we're stuck in this drama triangle thing. And I'm pretty sure you're stuck in the role of the, the persecutor and, and I'm the victim. Like, I don't, I don't see that going very well. Um, yeah, the persecutor would then tell you that you're wrong and that you're reading all the wrong information and, and your, your friends are telling you the wrong things and that you got to shape up. The persecutor prime often is a, is a narcissist or a bully, and they just like bullying people. They just like telling people what to do, and um, they can get along in life that way. But in the drama triangle, there's actually a link between all the roles, and they're actually trapped in that role. And uh, they may persecute the rescuer, telling the rescuer that they're, they don't know what the, in the world they're doing. And, and they're not going to stop because this is their power position. 
So how to get the persecutor to back off would be would be uh, challenging, and uh, maybe some insight might get through, or it won't get through, and then you would face other decisions whether you need to move on. Right. So so there is that element, as always, of someone being discerning and trying to figure out like, is this person that I'm perceiving to be a persecutor, are they adaptable? Are they flexible? Are they willing to, to work with me to show up or, or not? Well, also you'd need to take into account the role of the victim. Are you feeding the persecutor what they need? Are you trying to, as they say, sail a pizza past the wolf? You know, the persecutor may not pick up on things because your way of telling the persecutor may be either accusatory, which would get the persecutor to fight back, or may be so sympathetic and so helpless that the persecutor would see it as a weakness. So the victim would need to look at their role, whether they're really playing a role that makes themselves irresistible to the persecutor. And then the victim would need to look at whether they're uh, they need to empower themselves so they come across as more effective and uh, more more worthy of respect and um, get listened to. Yeah, and maybe this would be a good time to also talk about what you alluded to a few moments ago, which is that people often are are playing more than one role and can switch back and forth. Um Or they can perceive themselves as one role while the other person is perceiving them differently. And the example that pops into my mind immediately of that is um, you talk about the political system, uh, the political parties in our country where, um, you know, the the classic maybe Republican postures that they see themselves as the rescuer of the taxpayer and the... um, the Democrat might see themselves as the rescuer of the common person. And, and both of them perceive the other as a persecutor and that they're being victimized in some way by them. Well, that, that becomes a turnoff to the voter when they realize that politics has become a game of uh, accusing people, lying, accusing people of things. Uh, switching around and only taking one position and not knowing what's going on on the other side of the aisle. So a person gets out of the political game by by respecting both sides to see that each side has a following and they have a, a point of view. Now, the other question about the switching of roles is um, is very real. The persecutor may decide that they want to win the game, and if they're being accused of being a persecutor, they may switch. They may switch over to be a rescuer and say, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I really care about you, and I didn't mean that. It could all be a game. It could all be manipulation. Or they could be play the role of the victim in order to win the game and keep things confusing and keep things involved. So they could play the victim of, uh, you know, the, their, they, ne- they never can uh, be understood. They're really trying to help the person with the criticism, and they're being misunderstood. So you can wind up switching around the triangle in order to win. In order to not get pegged into one of the roles, you switch around so that you can win. Yeah, and what is what is winning exactly? Well, winning is the excitement, the excitement of the drama, of staying involved in some argumentative relationship or in some problems, problematic relationship, which is very involving. It's they're settling for negative strokes instead of positive strokes. But some people think po- negative strokes are just as good or even better, or they don't even know why they're involved, but they are involved. And sometimes they, sometimes they don't realize how involved they were until the game somehow ends, which could be, could be traumatic sometimes or, or mind-blowing. It could free them. They could all of a sudden feel free. The rest you would say, I'd rather be smarter than martyr. They don't want to be a martyr anymore. They want to be smart that they're out of the game and they're free again. And uh, so the victim might say, I'd rather be mad than sad. Instead of complaining all the time, they'd get angry at the whole game and say, why am I in this game? Why am I playing this 
silly role of a victim all my life. You know, I can get things for myself. And then they can empower themselves, which is a big part of the drama triangle and getting out as people learn to empower themselves and realize they can't change others, and but they can change themselves and get what they want in life. And where does this all, like, how did you come up with the compassion triangle as kind of the antidote to the drama triangle? Well, in transactional analysis, which started with Eric Burns' Games People Play, which was a runaway bestseller years ago, 120 weeks in a row on New York Times bestseller list. And I trained with Eric Byrne, and one of the principles in transactional analysis was with these three ego states. People can either play the role of a parent, adult, or a child, or be those people to others. And the, the thing is that the roles can be played positive and negative. Like the uh, critical parent role can be played in a negative way, which is always criticizing, but in a positive way, which is a strong uh, leader with decisive, with, with rules, and people follow them, and, and society is stronger because of the rules. So using that idea from Eric Byrne that, that all these ideas can be seen in a positive or a negative way, I started looking at each of the roles in the drama triangle can be either positive or regular, uh, either positive or negative. So, for instance, the persecutor is very negative because they keep the victim uh, feeling terrible about themselves. But if you get out of the triangle, you can. It can be positive. You can be an ag uh, aggressive, self-empowering person who's determined to to channel your energies into life and to being purposeful and and uh, productive. And and the rescuer. Ordinarily, is, is a as a person gets walked on all the time. People take advantage of the rescuer. They're always helping and and giving people another chance, and then another chance, and then a third chance. And but they can switch that negative rescuing to positive rescuing. They can they can love themselves and they can actually help themselves and help others. And the victim, instead of being the negative role of always needy, always helpless, never never learning anything that they need to learn, then they can switch that into the vulnerable role where they're actually open to uh, to uh, helping themselves and, and hearing other people and changing themselves. So all three roles can be either way. But one day I, I developed what I called the compassion triangle, which I could go into more if you want to. Yeah, let's do that. Okay, the compassion triangle is... I put that all together and realized that people are actually in all three roles at once. There's a primary role that everyone sees, but then there's two hidden roles. So using the example of a boss picking on a secretary uh, would be seen as a persecutor and people wouldn't like the boss. But secretly, if you want, if you want another way of looking at the boss or helping the boss, the boss is also a rescuer. The boss is rescuing the, the the uh, secretary who can't uh, do it right, uh, who can't learn fast enough. So by criticizing the, the, uh, the secretary or being a helicopter mom to the secretary, you know, they're really trying to impart information that would help the person. And in a way, they're also helping their own job because if people don't get their job done, then, then the boss could get fired. So the boss would also be a victim. It'd say, oh, my gosh. I'm running a ship that's going aground, and uh, people aren't doing their job right. So uh, then it's all three roles at, at once. And originally, I, that actually goes back to evolutionary days in which there's, which I call the drama triangle, which is another subject, but that's, in the evolutionary days, you have to trigger all three roles at once immediately in order to save the offspring to go on to a new, another generation. So I'll digress a bit into a situation I saw on TV on a Discovery Channel okay. where a tiger was approaching a, a baby elephant, and the bigger elephants circled the baby. So in a way, they were a rescuer. They were rescuing the baby. They were also persecutor because they could chase off the tiger. And then they were also victim because they saw their own family being threatened, and with empathy, they could feel the threat to the baby elephant. 
So all three have to be triggered. And, and going through different situations in evolution, all three of those uh, actually started out as instincts. So in a stress situation, all three of those are fired off at once. Interesting. And why, so why did you end up calling this the compassion triangle? Well, compassion triangle was, was, um, I, I picked that name, uh, somewhat for its appeal, but also because it helps you have compassion for each person. So instead of the saying the persecutor is evil and critical and narcissistic, you'd have compassion for the person also being a rescuer and a victim in what they were doing. And the same, you'd have compassion for the rescuer who could be criticized and saying, oh, you're a rescuer. You know, maybe a therapist is letting their patient call them at all hours of the night or something and, and not paying their bills. They could say instead of being critical of the person as a rescuer, you could see them as also a persecutor, which is keeping someone in a dependent position. And they're also a victim because they don't know how to get out of the situation because they they get so many strokes and purpose out of rescuing people. And the victim, instead of seeing them as, oh, you're a victim, you're just playing a manipulation game, you're a professional victim, you can see them as also a persecutor that they're they're keeping other people involved in their game, and they're also a rescuer. They're giving other people what they want. They're giving other people a victim to pick on so they don't need to to uh, look at their own lives. So it goes on from there. And in, the, in my book, A Game-Free Life, the first half of the book deals with, with all the different drama triangles in different situations, like the identified patient and all sorts of situations. And the second half of the book is all about uh, open, intimate communication and, and, and listening and accountability and how to get out of the, out of the games. Yeah, and so I think that you know, the danger is to, to start to get confused. Like, all right, well, if, if the persecutor is also the victim and also the rescuer, then like, what, how do those distinctions even matter? And I think what you're saying is that thinking about it this way is a good way to kind of stretch you outside of the boundaries of the, the game thinking where you're stuck in a particular role or where the other person is stuck in a particular role to develop a little bit more flexibility in how you're thinking about it. Yeah. The word compassion could get people drawn into forgiving other people for their game playing, like forgiving a persecutor and not actually realizing what they're actually doing with all their criticism. So, uh, you don't want to get soft. You need to know the games and you need to know the roles and you don't want to first get into forgiving everybody because that will be a rescuer and, and would keep you in the game. But what you, but the compassion triangle is used mostly to understand why the games are played. If you want to do that, now most people just deal with the drama triangle with the roles. I'm in this role, that role. And sometimes they get into the switches, which is, what the triangle really changed was the drama of changing roles and getting other people to line up as persecutors, rescuers, and victims, and getting lots of other people involved. So that's 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 the drama and the switches. But if you want to understand the reasons why a person gets into the game, the compassion gives you gives you three ways of talking to that person. Like that boss, you could say, "I know you're trying to you know rescue the person and help them by." By the criticism, but maybe it's not working. And also the boss saying, telling the boss how they're a victim. You know, you, you could be victimized. You could get fired if these people don't uh, learn their job. Or uh, so, so it's when you want to get into understanding the roles is when you use the compassion triangle. And usually, if you go on the internet to the different blogs and the other books written about the drama triangle, they mostly just describe the roles and how people get into the roles and what to do to empower yourself to get out of the role. They don't often get into the switches, which gets into dysfunctional family games. And I have a list in my book of all the dysfunctional family games. And But they don't go the next step, which is to actually understand why people are doing it, because that would get them too soft and, and they would tend to stay in the game if they were too sympathetic to the other people. Yeah, so when you're, say, working with a couple 
and let's just choose like a, a typical example, which is like one person is, is the, is always complaining, let's say. So one person always has complaint and the other person probably has the story of like, I can, like, it'll never be enough. What I do will never be enough for my, for my partner. How could you help them use the compassion triangle as a way to get out of that dynamic? Well, we'll we'll look at the three motivations behind each of their point. And I would do an exercise where each one would talk to the other person. One person would would say, let's say the complainer would say to the the other person, I know I'm complaining as a victim, but I'm also a persecutor into keeping you feeling guilty about my complaints. And I'm also a rescuer because I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm turning up the, the energy between us and giving you the uh, what you need in order to feel superior. And then that's, and then they would do the triangle for the other person. Like, I know you're coming on as persecutor, which isn't working because I'll, I'll fight it. But I know you're also the rescuer because you're trying to help. And, and I know you're also a victim because you feel this, this is intolerable and you're afraid of what the next step would be. So I would do an ex- the compassion triangle exercise and I'd have both people do it. So the victim would go through their three roles and the persecutor's three roles. And then the persecutor would have to tell the other one, here's my three roles and here are your three roles. This compassion triangle exercise is very, very moving and it's being adopted in many, many uh, treatment centers. And I just wish more people would uh, know about it and, uh, uh, and use it. Of course, wishing would be a, hoping and be a victim position. <laughs> so I'll back, I'll back off that one. <laughs> well, here we are they taking action that, you know, hopefully, uh, many of you will go out and, and grab a game free life. It's on Amazon and, and it, there's a lot of information in there. So there's a lot to absorb and, um, you know, even in just the description of the drama triangle and the, um, and the compassion triangle. And then as you mentioned, Stephen, you move on to talking about intimacy building and communication and, and building trust. And uh, obviously that's a lot of what we're, we're talking about here on, on my show, Relationship Alive. Um, because those are the, the building blocks of successful relationships. Um, yeah. Okay. So the second half of the book starts with the three rules of openness. It starts with the idea of how to set up communication. And the three rules of openness are bring it up, talk it up, wrap it up. And I put a whole lot in there, how to bring up your points so that people listen to it or how, to, how you can bring it up so they won't listen to it. And to talk it up, I talk about all the different games that go on, all the listening problems that go on, all the different uh, blocks that, that occur to keep someone from listening to your point. And then the the wrap it up, I have a whole different series of, of how rather than talk a point to death, you just you can wrap it up, and, and that would be the goal. In the uh, talk it up, I, I do a lot about listening, and I have a, uh, a lot of different theoretical ideas are, are written through, but they're all practical. And in the example you previously me- mentioned about the complainer, I'd have a person learn how to listen to the point the other person made. Now, I have, these, I have this thing called the listener's loop, which is the four things that ideally a good listener would do. And it's, I put them on a loop because they're all connected. So it's, it's letters S, E, V, F, F. S is for strokes. You give the person strokes for what, for who they are. And then the E stands for encouragement. You give them encouragement. You can keep talking. You can bring this up to me anytime. And that preserves the channel of communication. And the next letter is V for validation. You validate whatever is true that the other person says. And I do have a 10% rule uh, that 10% of everything you say is correct and 10% of everything you say is incorrect and 10% of the population would agree and that <laughs> and that and that I use in couples to make sure someone hears at least something that the other person says and then so that validates the point and then the final is the F for follow through that validates the purpose 
of, uh, uh, of the communication, that you show some results. After the communication, you show some tangible results of, of the discussion. That I call that the listener's loop. Yeah, it's... There's all, go ahead. There's also a loop of, of how you block people from ever getting their point across. I could mention that if you want. Sure, let's let's do that. So just and just to be clear, we're in the in the talk it up section of of your of your work. Yeah, so uh there's three letters four letters there in that loop, C A S E. These are the four ways that you can block a person from being effective in their communication. The first C is condescending. I guess Maybe the listeners or you could imagine a situation in which you're really earnestly trying to get through to another person. And that person in return first is condescending. They're looking down on everything you're doing. They're saying, oh, this is just your symptom of you've been talking to the wrong people. You're just a fool. Nothing you say is correct. So they would be condescending and look down on you. The next block would be abrupt. They would just suddenly cut off. Suddenly cut off the communication. Stop. I've had enough. Stop it. And then they would walk out the room or hang up the phone or something. That would be intimidating. And that would stop a communication. The next on the loop is S is for secretive. They would withhold all the information that you need in order to to hear their point of view. And they would withhold all the information that supports that you heard them. So they keep secretive and you can't you don't know where you stand with the person who doesn't give you enough information, but that's an information block by not giving enough information to let the com- communication proceed further. And the last block would be the person is that you're talking to is evasive. They would talk fast. They would change the subject quickly. They would lead you astray to another subject that's actually more interesting, and you would forget your original point. So that CASC or case block would would keep you from being effective. And, but if you know the four different blocks, maybe you can address one of them and break it down. If you can break down one of the blocks, then you can, the person will be open to listening to you. And according to the transactional analysis, positive negative rules, there's also a positive CASC that instead of condescending, you'd be caring for C. And instead of A, abrupt, you'd be approachable. Sure, it'd be nice to talk to someone who's caring and approachable. And instead of S for secretive, the person be sharing. Oh, great. This person is sharing information with me. Now we can move forward. And instead of E for being evasive, you'd say they're engaged. Oh, they stay engaged on the subject. We can have enough time to talk it all the way through rather than suddenly stopping the subject after 30 seconds or five seconds. So there's a positive and in the workshops that I do, and I do workshops all over the world, uh, the workshops, we, we have that exercise being done. A person practices each of those four negatives, and then the other one deals with them, and then you switch sides. And see. So in all these different information and communication blocks, uh, people can practice them. And in couples therapy, you can get them to actually practice uh, the negative CASE and then switch it to a positive CASE. And... All those can, all those things in the in the back half of the book can, are can be practiced and uh, as as social skills. Uh, I could mention that originally in games people play, the games were spelled out. Eric Byrne listed over a hundred games. It was a wildly, wildly popular book, but he didn't have a way of getting out of the games. He had something called an antithesis, like maybe one sentence or two for about four or five of the games that you could say that would just stop the game right there. But he didn't take it further. I was the only one in transactional analysis field that actually took that further. And my entire book is, is about what to do about it. Social skills training and relationship building training and intimacy building training that you can go beyond games with. Great. So let's, let's pull out a few more of those because there, there are so many in there that are really, well, what I like about it is that it, in the way that you, uh, quantify these ways of being, um, it makes it really clear in ways that, that I wouldn't have thought about before. Um, before we dive into one of them, there, there are two important things that I think we should mention. 
One is, I'm wondering if you, we've mentioned transactional analysis several times. It's your, it's been your field. Can you give us just like the 10,000 foot view for, for people listening? If you don't know what transactional analysis is, this is what it sure. is. Uh, originally the psychotherapy field was, was, um, was in the area of what Freud discovered. Like Freud was a hypnotist and he was a psychiatrist and, and he would, with his mind as a hypnotist, he figured that if you could take people all the way back to childhood and unleash all the tra- traumas and all the repressed energies of childhood, that this, this freed, this freed up energy would then allow them to be freer in their lives. So this was called the psychodynamic approach or this, or on a higher professional level, the psychoanalytic approach. And it all had to do with going back into childhood and understanding things. Eric Byrne came along in a very re- revolutionary times, the 1960s in San Francisco, very revolutionary times where everything was being rethought. And he said, why do you have to go back in childhood only? Let's, let's look at what's actually happening on the social level, uh, what's actually happening between people in the here and now that they have to deal with. Like, you can talk about your childhood all you want, but what if you're getting divorced or what if the, the boss has, has uh, demoted you and put your desk in a hallway or something when you're on vacation or some game you have to deal with? So he brought up the games and he gave very catchy names to them like, I'm only trying to help you or now I've got you USOB or <laughs> the game of kick me. And, and um, so he came So the book, of course, was wildly popular. Of course, people read it to to figure out the games other people were playing. <laughs> They weren't necessarily using it to figure out their games. But he brought up the whole level of a social level. So then transactional analysis had a social level, TA, it's called, TA for transactional analysis, and then a psychological level. Psychological level is when you go into the, to the depth, into childhood, which is now called scripting, how people write their life scripts when they're young, and then they play out their life scripts as if they're a place. And transactional analysis has a lot about script analysis. And I have a, maybe the middle section of my book is all about script analysis, how you find out what your position is in life. Like maybe you have an I'm okay, you're not okay position in life, or I'm not okay, you're okay, which was written in Tom Harris's book, uh, I'm okay, you're okay, which was the other big bestseller back in the 60s and, and 70s. So, Transactional analysis became a major force in in, uh, in psychology and, and psychiatry, and it's taught all over the world. We have training centers in 30 or 40 countries and, and conferences all over the world. So it's a major field in, in psychology. But because of the dominance of the psychoanalytic approach, some schools actually won't teach it. Mm. So that's one of the games people play of being of uh, protecting your turf, <laughs> uh, but it it gets more and more popular, and and uh, and you know my book sells. I'm probably selling about ten a week or so, and there's transactional analysis books and conferences all over the world all the time. So it's gotten pretty popular, and more people are looking at what goes on between people rather than just what went on in your childhood. Right, and so the idea is that you're analyzing what is actually happening between two people in the present moment as right and the only and the only precedent to that was back in the early 1960s in in the bay area that they started family therapy and they actually began to have names for what people are doing back and forth in the family therapy circle like like people where there were dyads and triads and sort of things like that but eric Byrne just jumped in way into the future by actually naming the games that each individual person was playing and and uh, and he brought it up at many different levels some of these games he wrote up at about six or seven different levels uh you know of, of why people are playing it and that uh, then appealed to the more depth-oriented people to realize there's a lot of depths and there's as many depths in what people are doing uh with each other as there were in what they were doing in their childhood, which I guess psychodynamically was like a do- there's a dozen defense mechanisms that people would employ that was pretty deep. But in TA, you have just as many or even more 
social defense mechanisms, how you keep people from getting intimate, how you keep people from making their point, how you keep people one down. So that, that sort of TA, primarily my book, went more in that direction. Yeah, and I think that is definitely one of the the valuable things is as soon as you see that you're in a particular game, it, you talk about like the the title that could be kind of on the front of someone's sweatshirt, like this is the game that I'm that I'm playing with you. Um, that it gives you a clue of like, oh, I'm I'm actually not really connecting with this person. We're just doing this this dance that actually prevents us from connecting yeah. with each other. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. The, the sweatshirt was an idea that Eric Byrne used to talk about in our seminars. And I trained with Eric Byrne for, in his weekly seminars in San Francisco for almost six years. And he used to talk about the sweatshirt jokingly, but I've taken it a lot further. It actually tells you what game a person's played. Imagine you're, you're, trying, to, you're trying to get through to somebody, and, and you look at their sweatshirt, and it says, I don't care about you or what you're saying. And, and all of a sudden, you, you say, my gosh, look <laughs> at that. And, and I, there's, I figure there's a couple of... I boil that down to two sweatshirts. One is the let's pretend sweatshirt. Is let's pretend I care about what you're saying, and the other was um, try and try and uh, try and make me listen to you. So the let's pretend and the try and sweatshirt just sort of not, breaks the game wide open. Sometimes you don't realize it until after you've left, and you think, my gosh, that person had a sweatshirt of, of I don't care what you say, or I'm never going to listen to anybody. And then you realize, wow, well, that's a game. And so the whole, um, uh, the whole core of a game can be wrapped up in their sweatshirt. And there's a lot of work in, in TA about uh, intuition, the use of intuition and, and, uh, and, and reading what people are doing, and then also ways of checking out your intuition. Stephen, we need to take a quick break to talk about this week's sponsors. Today's episode is being sponsored in part by Songfinch. Songfinch is a really cool company that creates custom songs made to order for the special occasions in your life. The way it works is that you tell them what the occasion is, what emotions you'd like your song to evoke, what genre of music you'd like, and then you tell them a little bit about your story. And their songs aim to bring your story to life. If you're a longtime listener, you may recall that I experimented with Songfinch as a way to celebrate my first anniversary with Chloe. I gave the songwriter a bunch of different details from our life together, important memories and images that were significant to us, and, well, the results were amazing. Who were we fooling with that dance we did? I'll let you hear the rest of the song at the end of today's episode. I was definitely impressed, though. Their songwriter created something that had just the right feel and sensitivity for us to celebrate our first anniversary together. And listening now, I definitely get emotional. So many beautiful memories and feelings conveyed through that song. You can also create a slideshow to sync up with the finished song to give it even more of an impact. All this is to say that I think a Songfinch song would be a really inspired gift to someone special in your life. So check them out at songfinch.com so you can hear what they do. They offer songs starting at $99, and if you choose to do a song from scratch, as a Relationship Alive listener, they are giving you $25 off if you use the coupon code ALIVE25. Visit songfinch.com and use the coupon code ALIVE and the number 25 
for $25 off your personalized song from scratch. Our other sponsor today is Audible. What might it look like if we all listened more? You're here listening to Relationship Alive, of course, and along with podcasts, listening to audiobooks motivates us, inspires us, and even brings us closer together. Audible has the largest selection of audiobooks on the planet. And now, with Audible Originals, the selection has gotten even better, with custom content made for members. Sometimes when you're living life on the go, an Audible book can be a great way to learn about something new or improve your relationship skills by listening when you're commuting or even simply getting the dishes done. So many of the books that we've featured here on the podcast are also available on Audible, so it's an easy way to dive deep on something that can truly enhance your life. Start listening with a 30-day Audible trial today. Choose one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. Just go to audible.com slash relationship or text the word relationship to the number 500 500 to get started. That's audible.com slash relationship or text relationship to the number 500 500 for your free 30 day audible trial which gives you one audiobook and two Audible originals absolutely free. And thank you so much, Audible and Songfinch, for giving us something beautiful, enriching, and entertaining to do with our ears, and for sponsoring this week's episode of Relationship Alive. And now, let's get back to our conversation. So if I had, let's say I was with someone and I thought their sweatshirt was... Let's pretend that we're, that we're going to work on our problems together. Maybe that would be mm-hmm. a good one. How do I know if that person is actually just playing the game with me? Because like on the back of their sweatshirt, it would be actually I'm the one in charge here or something like that. Yeah. Well, that was, that was the original sweatshirt of Eric Byrne. There's the front of the, front of the sweatshirt and what you see and the back is after the switch and the switch is very important in games like you you think you see something and then you get a switch and all of a sudden you say oh my god that's what happened so that sweatshirt is could be an alcoholic wearing a sweatshirt let's pretend i'm going to stop drinking this time or uh let's let's pretend that that your insights get through to me and uh and then the, the rescuer or the codependent could say, uh, let's pretend I'm, go- I'm going to be effective right now and, and you're listening to me. Or, or let's pretend we're all going to live happily ever after. So, but it's, it's an intuition that you might not be able to think of in the heat of the game. But when you walk away the game, you say, my God, I'm talking to a sweatshirt that says, I don't care about you. And I never will on the back. Yeah. How would you test that out? How would you know if, because I think it it can be easy to step back from a person and just say, oh, like my, okay, I have a story about this person, which is that I'm never, they're never going to care about me or they're, they're, they're actually not interested in me. Actually, that might be a good one. I'm thinking about like going out on a first date with someone and trying to have, trying to navigate the awkwardness of that and, um, and maybe coming away from that thinking like, yeah, this person, they just don't care about me. How would you find out if that sort of thing was actually true? Uh, well, probably in time it'll come out. Or, or say, if a, or you mentioned a date. If, if, that, if the guy thinks a, sees a girl sweatshirt and says, I'm not, a ma- I'm not romantically attracted to you, well, then, then he, he moves differently. He, he talks to her in a different way rather than assuming... Uh, you know, I'm a hottie and you're my man, thinking that that's what's going on. So it's a way of sort of catching on to what what's going on. What what's the game? That's is there a game and what are the real positions? Now it's okay to be hoping and to wishing and and maybe this is going to work out. This is going to be fine, but it's only when there's there's a game. And one way of figuring out what the game is 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 to see the sweatshirt and. Uh, and then you go from there. You can bring it up. There's a new type of therapy called uh, 
a relational therapy in which the therapist shares their feelings with their with their uh, client and and they could actually say to the the client uh, uh, I feel you're you're not interested in anything I say you know and that could open up a conversation uh, but it's fine to express your feelings of what you think is going on as long as there's an openness contract a uh, contract to be to be open and share with each other without games. Oh my goodness, you're just reminding me of so many things that are that are in your book. Um okay, so before we dive in there, just going back to the um to the case um the blocks to communication that you were talking about, um K C for uh, being condescending, A for abrupt, S for secretive, E for evasive. If I sense one of those things happening in my partner or the person that I'm talking to, what's what's a strategy that you've seen be effective in? Because you mentioned like sometimes you can take on one of those blocks and and break it down and then you get through and then you're back to communicating with that person. Well, the, the first step in and learning the games people play and learning intimacy communication uh, and so forth is, is to identify it. So if you identify the person as condescending, you would say, wait a minute, I need a little more respect from what I'm saying. Here's, here are my points. Uh, so you could go for that. If you heard the person's abrupt, you'd, you'd set up in advance. I need at least five minutes to talk to you. Will you give me five minutes? So then you have a, a way of dealing with that. For the secretive block, you'd say, I need you to tell me why you're doing this, and I'll tell you why I'm doing it. So you set up a sharing uh, uh, substitute for the S, and then for the for the E, the evasive. Um, and you say, I don't want to start changing the subjects, or as soon as they change the subject, you say, Wait, you're changing the subject on me. You're not here, or you're not hearing me, or let's stay on this one point. It's important. So knowing what the blocks are. You can actually address each one, and it'd be more effective than than if you just threw up your hands and say, "Well, you're impossible. I can't talk to you." Right, which might work also. <laughs> right. Well, it it would work in a different way, I guess, of keeping things the way they are. Um, I'm I'm curious. You mentioned earlier, very briefly. Um, I think you call they're called the ego states. The the um, critical parent, the nurturing parent, the adult, the free child, the adaptive child. I think I'm remembering those right. Um, and the way that each of those gives us some flexibility in how we interact with other people and maybe also how we get stuck in in one or, or another mode. Um, can we talk about that for just a little bit and then what I'd love to do is kind of bridge that into your, your map of intimacy and, and how, how people can think about the level of intimacy, the intimacy scale between them and another person. Okay. So, uh, the ego states was Burns way of, uh, externalizing Freud's super ego, ego and id, which is three, uh, uh, factors of the, of the internal mind. A person has a super ego that's critical of themselves, or you know, they have an ego which deals with the world, or they have an id which is powerful forces. So, Freudian dynamics was based on that. Well, Eric Byrne took it out into the real world and said, in the real world, there are people out there you see as your parent, as your adult, or as a, as a child, and uh, and that gave you a way of looking at people. So that was the starting point. Now, each ego state, it gets subdivided a little bit, and they can be in a positive or negative way. Like the, the parent is, is sort of subdivided into uh, into the matros and patros, I guess, is the father and the mother, you know, and different kinds of systems around the world. So the critical parent would, would be the authoritative one that, that um, maintains the rules of society and, and correctness and ethics, uh, but the negative critical parent would be the one who would just demean and criticize people endlessly. So all all the ego states have positive and negative sides. Now the flexible person is the one who stays in contact flexibly with all of their ego states. They can move in and out e easily. And one of Eric Burns' 
dozen books, a half dozen books. It's called the the moving self. At times when you talk to someone, if you need to go to the okay critical parent, you say, "Wait a minute, you're you're breaking our rules," or if you need to go to the uh, the rebel child, you might say, "Oh, come on, let's have some fun. This is silly." So you need to be able to move around, or you can move into the adult and say, "Wait a minute, uh, I'm not sure what's going on. Let's let's look at the process and let's see what where we're going with the information." So you need to be able to move around all the ego states, and uh, so that's the flexible person. A person who gets locked in, they could get locked into critical parent, or locked into only free child, where all their ne- only negative free child, where they're just silly all the time, and you can't ever talk to them. Or it could get locked into the negative nurturing parent that just only wants to rescue victims. All they care about in the world is victims, and and uh, everything you do is a symptom of something. So you could get locked into a certain ego state yourself, and you can be talked to someone else who's locked into one ego state only, and that's called the excluded ego state. So there's a lot about ego states that Eric Byrne writes about in his in his early books. And it's a good way ego states is a good way of identifying who you're talking to. There's actually an idea by Dr. Doucet called the egogram. And you look at someone and you see this vertical bar graph of how much critical parent they're showing, how much nurturing parent is there nurturing parent, uh, adult, free child, adapted child, and you get an idea of who they are. If you're talking to a real tough person, that person's critical parent could be first on the bar graph, their adult could be second, and maybe their free child or their vulnerable adapted child is very low. Or it could be talked with a very flexible, easily manipulated person. They may be all in their child and all either playful or, or sorrowful or hurtful, and, and they have no parent, no strength. That, that you can rely on. Uh, so there's a lot in TA about about the ego states, and, and uh, I go into that in my books, too, because I have this one a variant of this option, this article I called called Options, and showing you how you can switch among your different ego states in order to handle a situation with somebody else. Yeah, so what would be, what would be an example of that? Hmm? So if you, so if I wanted to, let's say I was trying to assess if where someone was at, and I, I like how you brought that up in terms of the, like looking at them and, and seeing where they show up on the bar graph, you know, are they high in one dimension or low in another? Do you have suggestions for how you elicit different states from other people? Well, there's two ways. That, uh, I have a summary of the options article in my book, A Game Free Life. And then in my latest book, Collected Papers in Transactional Analysis, I have a copy of the original options article, which gives you all the examples. That's different from the egogram, which is an intuition uh, reading of the other person in which you can tell how much ego state energy is, is in the other person that you're dealing with. So it's an intuition exercise, uh, intuition reading like the sweatshirt or just uh, would be the egogram and, and the sweatshirt would be ways of reading uh, a person that you're talking to. Got it. Got it. Um, okay. Let's, if we can, in our, in our last few minutes here, um, one thing that I think you describe really beautifully in your book are the ways that we construct intimacy in in relation to another person. And the, the two concepts that come to mind here for me are the, um, the trust contracts that we create with others. And then the, uh, the intimacy, I think you call the intimacy scale, which helps you see like where you're at in terms of uh, your levels of intimacy with another person. So, um, okay. yeah, let's, let's dive in there. Okay. Thank you for mentioning this. Over the years, I pretty much I've I've developed a lot of different ideas. I had an older sister who had who had a uh, who used to teach have one new idea every year or one new uh, project that you master. And she would say, "Well, one year you master bowling, another year you master handcrafts." So I said upon myself that each year I I wanted to create a new theory. So both of those are new theories. 
the five trust contracts for couples are might turn out to be one of the most popular ideas I've done. And that is um, you draw the two sets of ego states facing each other and the trust contract between the okay critical parent and the okay critical parent, the other person is the, the no collapse contract. You agree to the uh, contracts you've made. You don't suddenly stop working. You don't suddenly stop your hygiene. You don't suddenly break all the rules. Like you don't, you know, so the no to- trust contract is between the critical parents. Right. That's also like you don't you don't threaten to leave the other person or. Yeah. And between yeah. the two nurturing parents, the, the couple agrees on the uh, on the protection contract that it's in your mind to protect the other person from giving putting them to too much stress. Between the adults is the openness contract. Bring it up, talk it up, wrap it up at a good timing. You know, not just any time. And then between the free child, it's the enjoyment contract that you really want to give the other person lots of pleasure and whatever you can in the other in their lives and the two of you. And between the adapted child is the flexibility contract that you agree to give in. You don't have to win 51% of all the arguments. And so th- this is an ideal that they that they live by. They, now each person needs to live by it themselves. Um, and they also look to to it being uh, maintained in the other person, but they can all break down very quickly. Like I had one example of an alcoholic who went out and got drunk in a restaurant and was screaming. Right away, he broke the no collapse contract. He just broke down and threw a scene. He broke the nurturing, the protection contract. He everyone got embarrassed. Everyone's child got embarrassed, and uh, and uh, so that was broken. The openness contract was broken because you couldn't talk things over with him. It was, he was in a don't think mentality. Uh, and then the free child, the enjoyment of the contract, there was nothing enjoyable about that dinner in the restaurant when he threw a scene with the restaurant that even Jack Nicholson would have been happy with in one of his books, movies. And then between the, the adapted child, the flexibility contract, he was, there was no flexibility there. He wouldn't yield to people telling him to please stop or anything. So all contracts can be broken, and when a marriage relationship or long-term relationship is breaking down, sometimes one by one, the contracts are broken. Maybe the enjoyment contract is broken first. They just talk too much about issues and and drag themselves down. Uh, Or maybe the no-collapse contract is broken. They go out and have a partner somewhere else. So one by one, the contracts can be built up, but they also can, can be broken down. And there was, uh, and then you also mentioned, uh, was it the uh, intimacy scale? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I catalog there the subjects that people talk about. I've never seen anyone do that. It's uh, I I go on five levels: twenty percent, thirty, twenty percent, forty percent, sixty percent, up to hundred percent. These are the actual topics that people talk about. Some of the topics can bring people closer which is on the right of the scale at 100%, or they can distance people. Uh, Eric Byrne once used the example of a very awkward first date. Guy looks around and, and looks at the room and says, my, aren't the walls perpendicular tonight? You know, <laughs> that, that doesn't take things very far. So at the first level, at the 20% level, it's silence. It's pretty much nothing is said, but it could be an okay silence, a break. And time, just a, 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 a breather. At right, you could be you could be staring into each other's eyes in silence, which might actually feel very intimate. Yeah. Right, and uh, but but that's a topic of conversation would be no topic, but silence. You're not sure whether what it's what's going on, so it doesn't really build intimacy. Maybe it might. The next level will be forty percent, which is things, objects, and places, which is. The guy is saying, my, aren't the walls perpendicular tonight? Or people can just talk about the, the uh, restaurants in town, sort of awkwardly trying to come up with one after another until the conversation runs down. Or you could uh, hear at a diner the, the uh, truck drivers talking about the, the different stoplights and the police things. That doesn't develop intimacy. It doesn't get people into, into who they are and what they believe in. But that comes at the 60% level. And I have uh, several different PI, people, you talk about people and ideas, 
or philosophy and issues or psychology. You talk about what people think about and believe in things, and they get to get into themselves, and that gets a little more closeness going. Now, at the 80%, I have it divided with an M, Y, me or you. You actually interview the other person, find out a whole lot about who they are, what their beliefs are, what their hobbies are, their family is, and then you talk about yourself a lot. It gets uneven if one person only talks about themselves or they interview the other person so the other person only talks about themselves. But that gets close when you learn a lot about the person. But it's not the same as 100%. At 100% level, there's a you, us. Talk about us. What do we feel about each other? Uh, What happened when we first met each other? What are the things we're going to do together? What's going on between us? And you talk about at the us level, and you share feelings about each other and, and the two of you. So that all can be practiced, you know, in workshops or or between couples. You can practice each one of the different levels, so you get an idea of conversations. It's it's mostly useful when people first meet each other, uh, and when when conversation can go dead or they can go right. I mean, somebody can jump too fast. A person, a guy on a first date, could jump all the way over to me and you and us and and proposition her or. Someone could, and then she could bring it back to things, uh, you know, like uh, wallpaper decorations or something. <laughs> like he could, so it, it gives an idea of the different topics that people talk about, whether it brings them closer or it brings it takes them further apart. Yeah, and I could see that being instructive, just like you know, as you're with another person like, oh, are they in their critical parent? Are they in their adult? Are they in their free child? You could just as easily be like, all right, what are we talking about? And what is that? Like, if I want to build more closeness with this person, then I might take this to like trying to figure out their, their philosophies and ideas and interests and, and, um, and eventually, um, get into, you know, our deepest beliefs, what they, what, what they believe, what I believe and, and that that actually helps bring you closer in a situation where you're feeling a little distant from either someone you've been with for a long time or someone you're just meeting. Right. Yeah. And, and by the way, none of this should be called manipulative. Like, OK, now I'm going to go to the 20 percent level. Now I'm going to go to 60 percent. It's actually people are just identifying what what good conversations are. Now, of course, a salesman could learn it immediately and go right over to all the way up to 100 percent and and con you into thinking that uh, you know the new vacuum cleaner you buy is 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 what brings the two the two of them together um but all these things you know options how to switch ego states or uh, the different levels of communication all these things are things that you learn and eventually become part of you because there are people out there who automatically know all these things so you know, it's okay to go to school and learn your social skills if that's what you need when you go into therapy or, or you read a, a book on on relationship building, which is my uh, Game Free Life book. Yeah, so I want to let you know, listening, that w- even though we've covered so much in this conversation today, it's not even half of what <laughs> of what's in this book, and it. I really was struck with, you know, every several pages, like, wow, there's another valuable resource. Wow, there's another way to think about this and to, to extract kind of the core of what's happening in every given, in a particular given situation to get to something meaningful. So again, um, Stephen Cartman, he created the drama triangle, his book, A Game Free Life, which talks about the drama triangle, the compassion triangle, and then all of these tools for, for building intimacy and dealing with communication issues. Um, because this, this isn't a book that's just for couples. It's about kind of how you navigate the world and, and stay game free as much as possible. Um, so it's really, really valuable stuff in there. Um, I should put, I should put in a plug that it's available on Amazon. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I think so, I mentioned that earlier and we'll make sure that we have links to all of that in the show notes and transcript for today's episode, which as a reminder, you can get if you visit neilsatin.com slash 
triangle, as in the drama triangle, or you can text mm-hmm. the word passion to the number 33444 and follow the instructions. And um, Stephen, what's a good way if people want to find out more about your work other than grabbing the book on Amazon? What's your website? Okay. Uh, I do have about 30 papers I've written, which go into much more detail of the ideas that are in A Game Free Lie. And I've, I just recently came out with that. It's called Collected Papers in Transactional Analysis, about 280 pages. Um, I can sell it from my website. All I have to do is type in my name and on Google, and you'll go, go to my website. And eventually Amazon's going to have it. But uh, I really appreciate you uh, you inviting me, Neil, and, and, and sharing some of these ideas. And I would like people to have a game-free life, and that's what I've been working on. And uh, and I and I really appreciate the uh, time you've you've spent and and uh, the time we've worked on together to to make this interview happen. So I really want to thank you very much and and thank your viewers for for listening. Yeah, my pleasure. It's been so great to have you. And you know, this is stuff you've been working on for decades. So what a treat to one that you were able to put so much of it into your book and also that we've been able to, to meet and chat about it um, for, for the people today who are just finding out about your work. Um, I do have one last quick question for you, if that would be okay. I'm okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So um, when we were talking about the trust contracts, I'm just wondering if, if I were listening to that and thinking, Oh, okay, I'm, I'm hearing the contracts that I've navigated really well with my partner, let's say, but I've, but I can see that here's a contract, like the enjoyment contract that I've just let fall apart completely, or, or even that I feel like my partner is let, is sliding on one of those contracts. What would you suggest as a, as a good first step for people to, uh, to have the us conversation that, allows them to repair around a broken contract? Well, uh, generally it would be communication again, like stating what the problem is and your feelings. And if there's an actual issue or situation, you could do the compassion triangle and your motivations for that situation and their motivations. So uh, it primarily is is just identifying the issue and and, uh, working out what you can do and what you can't do. And uh, but primarily the five trust contract you should uh, apply to yourself that and the enjoyment contract that you really won't keep it in your heart that you want the other person to be happy and any kind of flexibility you can do on the flexibility contract would be fine but there's some things you cannot do and you can't be expected to and there's some things you can do that maybe you might do uh, but. Uh, you know, you could be, get more in touch with your free child, the more playful self, self, or if the other person has trouble getting into their free child and their playfulness, you could stroke them and, and uh, when they do get into the free child, tell them how much you enjoy that. And um, I don't have an actual situation to, to talk about. These are pretty general uh, for people on any of the five trust contracts. Is, it's something to talk about, but talk about it with all the rules of sharing and uh and communication and and uh you know i mentioned the the uh listening loop and also there's a information iceberg i didn't mention there's four levels of how you can get your point across uh get your maybe it's too late in the interview to go through it but no go for it one is one you get your point across and then underneath the water of the iceberg it's the first eyes information you want to give all the information behind your point to support it. And you want to get a chance to get that inform out, information out there before the person cuts off the conversation. And the next eye on the iceberg uh, is importance. You want to be able to get across the importance of your idea, why it's important to be listened to. Like if you're talking at a board meeting, uh, you want to be able to get across the importance of, of why your idea needs to be taken up by the business or with someone you're talking to, why it's important that, that this conversation is heard. And then the last A at the I at the very bottom is actually a trauma triangle for the bottom of the iceberg is, is the intent. You want to make sure you know that people know that your intent is not persecutor uh, or rescue or victim, but it's, it's to uh, share information to uh, move the relationship on uh, in the five trust contracts. 
Mm. And you actually made me think of just revisiting briefly a question that we touched on at the very beginning, which is, I'm curious about in your experience, how do you know when someone is just kind of stuck in the game? And, you know, you you try all these things and, you know, is there a point at which you think one can say like, all right, I think I've, I think I've given this what I can give it and it's time to, to move on <laughs> it to, uh, you know, this person is stuck no matter what I do. It takes a while to get stuck. Um, you know, if you're a rescuer and you're persistent, you'll, you'll stay in there. If you have these drivers that say, try hard and, and uh, please them and, and be perfect in, in how you please them. Uh, the drivers can, can keep you stuck in, in the relationship a long time. Now, you could n- maybe not even be in a game and you, you meet somebody for the first time and you just, that's it. You just don't want to go further. You may give it a couple of tries and then it's over. So it's getting into the triangle takes a while to get in there because then it gets complicated because all three roles are beginning to emerge as motivations in each person, and that complicates it a bit. But uh, it takes a while to get to the point where we realize, hey, we're stuck. And then you could talk about the idea of being stuck. Maybe from the compassion triangle, you could settle on a particular issue. And you, once you got the issue settled on, then you talk about your three motivations uh, for for hanging on to this issue. But, yeah, defining an issue is is usually a point to decide whether you can move on or not. Got it. Yeah, and and you do a good job at one point in the book of talking about, it was, I think, in a work situation with two people who are, you know, having, it's impossible for them to get along, and where one of them simply is willing to listen and the other one actually does the whole compassion triangle for themselves and for the other person out loud as a way of helping build a bridge of understanding between the two of them. Well, if it's a work situation, you wouldn't necessarily do it out loud with everyone listening because, because the boss could lose face or something like that, but it'd probably be in a closed room where people would share. Let's look, is it okay? First you get the contract, you know, the contract to talk. Is it okay if we talk about this? That avoids, a rescue victim situation. The person says, yes, okay, let's uh, set aside five minutes to talk. Then you say, well, I would like to go through what I feel is going on and what I feel is going on with you, and then you can correct me or tell me what's going on with you. But then you share an awful lot of feelings. You share your persecutor, rescue, and victim and what you think is theirs. That's six right there. And then they share their persecutor, rescue, and victims of what they think their motivation is, and then their they're three and then they're three about you. So there's actually, you know, 12 feelings to get shared. I mean, it can be a huge sense of relief when, when the compassion triangle exercise is done, but first you got to get a contract an agreement that let's go through it and, and how much time to be set aside and, and maybe even an agreement of what to do if, uh, if the communication goes wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. Well, Stephen Cartman, again, thank you so much for being here with us today. And you've shared so much valuable information. And uh, I'm, I'm excited to see what unfolds for our listeners who take this and, and run with it. So thanks so much for giving us more of a perspective on how to apply the drama triangle, the compassion triangle, and all these other great ways of building trust and intimacy. Great. Thanks, Neil, and for all your listeners for listening. And And uh, we'll talk more later. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another episode of Relationship Alive. If you like what you've heard and want to make it easier for other people to find out about us, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast and to rate and review us on iTunes. If you have questions or comments or want to continue the conversation, you can always join our Relationship Alive community Facebook group. And for more information about today's episode, visit us online at neilsatin.com slash podcast. Or you can always text the word PASSION, P-A-S-S-I-O-N, to the number 33444 for more information. Finally, 
Do you have a burning question that you're hoping we can have answered here on Relationship Alive, either for a future or past guest? Let me know and I'll see what I can do. Take care and see you next time. Now all I want to do is watch you dance.